Okay, well, I guess we will get started. Um, welcome, everyone, to this session. One of the first, I guess, in a lot of ways. I feel I've been here for maybe 48 hours. I feel like I've already packed it in, but this is one of the sort of first uh, start of the sessions. My name, is, oh, my name is Greg Albers. I'm the Digital Publications Manager at the Getty. Um, I'm just here to chair the session today um, and basically get out of the way of the speakers um, as much as I can. Um, we are actually m currently down one speaker. Um, James Vitale from, the, from LACMA hasn't appeared yet, but we're going to, um, regardless, start, um, start with one and see how it goes from there. Um, so our first and maybe only speaker is Joseph Mohan from the uh, Art Institute of Chicago. Um, he's going to be speaking about one publisher, many platforms, and all the work that they're doing there um, for digital publications, exploring different avenues, um, both in formats and distribution. And with that, I will give it over to Joseph. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for showing up. So yeah, I'm Joseph Mohan, Associate Director of Production at the Art Institute. I'm in the publishing department. Um, I've been at the museum about nine years. And for six of those, roughly, we were an entirely print-based uh, operation. We produce 12 to 15 titles a year. And that is now obviously split between print and digital online. Um, but Personally, I've always been interested in technology and how it um, can deliver content and um, digital content platforms. So this has been a pretty fascinating transition. The title of my talk, One Publisher, Many Platforms, um, as I've prepared it, I realized that a more appropriate title might have been One Publisher, Four Platforms. <laughs> um, so this is what I'm going to be talking about. Um, each of these really has a different audience, a different purpose, um, different motivations for why we're involved with them. So I'm going to talk about like opportunities and challenges we've encountered, um, some pros and cons. I'm not going to do a super specific examination of like the merits of each and every one of these. I'm just here to talk about our experiences working with um, these different in the, in the different endeavors. Um, we have developed a sense of what works, what doesn't, like what's appropriate in different platforms. Um, because we're trying to achieve the same goal with however we deliver our content. Um, you know, we almost exclusively produce scholarly museum publishing. Um, and so I think a lot about how to shift our thinking to not see so much of a divide between print and digital, because in the end it's all very similar. Um, so first I'm going to talk about iStoria, which is a Yale University Press endeavor that's actually just getting started. Um, we are just newly involved with this as of the past few months. Um, we were asked by Yale to contribute to this, um, this portal. Uh, we're the only museum that's involved in the um, initial launch. Um, and it's actually, uh, of everything I'm going to be talking about, it's what we're, in, we're least involved with it. We're contributing content and we're consulting. Um, but we're not developing the platform, so it's relatively low impact for us. Um, and we're excited about it because we're going to get more of our, our titles into a, a digital format. Um, it's based on this thing called Librios, which is an information management and deployment platform. And we're going to see a beta version pretty soon. So maybe next year we'll have more to talk about. Um, so yeah, it doesn't exist yet. So um, I'm going to show you this owl wearing a mortar board because uh, the, the audience is academia. It's professors and students, specifically like course packeting. Um, and this, this is going to be somewhat unique in that we're, divide, we're dividing our content. It, we're not gonna, it's not going to be complete catalogs. We're chopping things up, which we've never done before. Um, what we're offering to the portal are mostly uh, books by a senior curator, Richard Townsend, who is the, um, the head of the African and Amer Indian. No, what do we call it now? African and Indian Museum. Right there. Um, Hero Hawk and Open Hand, Ancient West Mexico, Casas Grandes, Sacred Landscapes. If you're in the right field, these are like pretty big titles. Um, these are the most. These titles are the most frequently requested content through the Copyright Clearance Center. Um, so they're hugely popular, um, but they're out of print. So this is a great opportunity for us to bring new life to these these titles. Um, and not just by making them more available, but there's going to be enhanced content that will have um, 
videos that were originally created for the exhibitions that these, these catalogs accompanied. Um, we'll have like three sp 360 spinning views of some of the artwork. We're replacing um, black and white images with some color images. Um, and then one really important thing for us is that this is actually a portal. It's actually going to be a destination. Um, it'll be a trick to get people to use it, we think. Um, but it, it can be this critical mass of content um, that could attract a core audience. And that differentiates it from a few of the other pro projects I'm going to be talking about. Um, there are, we have encountered a few challenges so far. Our administration is concerned about what impact this is going to have on our resources, our time. Um, we're still excited to see what happens. Um, it's a fair point. This has already sort of come true. I see Lou in the back there. He knows that um, he's the head of our imaging department. Um, he knows that this has already taken up his staff's time trying to dig up images and replace them and whatnot. And we've also had a hard time determining who has the rights to the text in some of these books. Um, we think we've sorted it out, but these are old books and they're governed by old contracts that um, sometimes we can't find. Uh, but we think we got it sorted out. Um, so OK, moving along. Next, I'm just going to talk about EPUBs. Um, we are going to put out an EPUB. It's not out yet. We're looking at it for next year, which is funny because EPUBs are kind of the most basic standard ebook format people think of. It's probably older, if not the oldest format there is. Um, but you know, that's we haven't pursued it heavily because it's it's a pretty blunt instrument. Um, we really value beautiful tailored design for all of our books, um, and that's it's basically impossible to port it to this. Um, to this format. Um, but, like I said, we're going to try it, and our first title is uh, Winslow Homer, The Color of Light, which is from 2008. Um, now, it's, it's a funny choice at first glance because this book is, is really beautiful. It has a gorgeous design done by Studio Blue, which is a Chicago design firm. Um, but this book is totally out of print, and copies go for well over $100 on Amazon. And um, in addition to being like a really great book about Winslow Homer, it's also really sought after by watercolor enthusiasts. Um, there's a lot of conservation information in there about his pigments and techniques and other te technical information. And so we decided to sort of like take a risk. It's a risk from our point of view to divorce text from design in this case. Um, and we're curious about the target audience. Um, the print version, like I said, seems to have been popular outside of a standard art book crowd. Um, and so we hope that this content, content can thrive in a different format, maybe without what we consider a really important part of it. Um, and you know, so there are, like, there are pros to the EPUB format. Um, and this might not be news to a lot of you, but it's a pretty cheap and simple to produce format. Um, you can output it from InDesign. Um, for a book where you don't have an InDesign file, you can outsource the scanning and OCRing, and you can get, I think for this, we paid like 39 cents a page to have it scanned and OCR'd and delivered to us in XML. A lot of printers will just do this for you as part of, if you're printing an actual book, you can just have them give you back an EPUB of it. Um, it's a really durable format. It's non-proprietary. Um, nobody's going to go out of business and destroy it. Um, it's basic data that won't be abandoned. It's like an MP3. Um, and of course, like there's a, just a huge number of devices that can read an EPUB, uh, iOS and Android and e-readers and any computer, really. Um, and oddly enough, we could actually make money with this because we're going to sell it through Yale University Press, who, which distributes all of our print books. Um, and there's, you know, there is a retail infrastructure exists for an EPUB, which is um, not always the case. Um, some of it's pretty bad, though. There are a lot of cons. Uh, they're really ugly, in my opinion. We had a vendor come to us, like periodically vendors come to us and beg us to put our books in EPUB. And so one time we took them up on their offer to make a sample, and it was just terrible. Um, text is really what an EPUB, text thrives in an EPUB, images don't. Um, you know, one of the benefits is that you can change the size of the text and the pagination reflows, which is great if you're reading a novel. If you have images that are tied to the text, which we're always really sensitive to, it's not great. Um, and typography, which is always like a really key component of our books, of our book's design, 
does not fare well at all in an EPUB. I mean, you know, if, if your design is integral to the concept or the meaning of your book, it's, I don't know, it's kind of pointless in my opinion. I mean, the latest spec of, of the EPUB um, standard is, is better than it used to be. Um, it supports CSS. If you're really savvy, you could probably design something great from the ground up, I would guess, but to try to take a designed print book and push it in there, you're not gonna get anything really analogous. Um, it does also support a fixed layout capability, but from what I've seen of that, it's really just a PDF. Um, okay, so next, enhanced content eBooks. This is how I just, just describe a more complicated, fancier digital book. Um, we've done two titles with two different platforms in this category. They're both adaptations of existing um, exhibition catalogs. And it's important to note that these were both, for us, pure experimentation. Um, nobody in the museum asked us to do this. We just wanted to see what would happen. So we had no budget. We, like, whatever small costs we had, we snuck it into other project budgets. Um, but that being said, like, it was maybe a few hundred bucks. It was really actually pretty cheap. Um, we took advantage of some really savvy interns um, who were working with us and some volunteer labor. Um, and honestly, it was pretty easy. Um, it's, it's easy because these are commercially available platforms and all the content for these existed already. The books were written, the books were published, edited, everything. So we could pretty easily port it. Um, but of course, um, it wasn't actually that easy. Um, it required a lot of work. The editor has to go back and do a pretty deep read of all the text because you'd be surprised at how much, how much uh, text is really actually geared toward being on paper. Um, references to page callouts, like, positional, directional text saying, see opposite page, see next page. That doesn't always make sense once you're seeing it on a screen. Um, our photo editor had to go back and re-clear rights because we don't typically request rights for um, digital projects when we request rights for a print book. We started doing it, but it's always a little dicey because sometimes they cost more, and that can have impact on your project budgets. Um, and then there's image preparation. We take all of our CMYK separations and shunt them back into RGB and we reprofile them and resize them and do other tweaks. Um, really the hardest part was finding time to work on them. Like I said, nobody asked us to do these. They could never be a priority. Um, so the, you know, they never had an official deadline and in the face of everything else we do that did have deadlines, it was pretty tough. Um, and also of course, like these are proprietary for, um, platforms we built, with, built these in. There's no guarantee you'll be able to see them in an, any number of years. Um, so it's definitely valuable for us that they still exist as a printed book. Um, so to get a little bit more into detail, the first one we did was fashioning the object, which was, um, uh, actually, before I get to that, I wanna talk a little bit about audience. Um, we made these basically for a general art book audience. We sort of imagined that the same people who would buy the print catalog might be interested in this. Um, they might be interested particularly in the advanced content, the enhanced content that is available beyond the printed book. And also um, the audience is Apple users because they're both only for iPad. Um, so yeah, these were adapted, both, both projects I'm gonna talk about were adapted from smaller exhibitions with smaller exhibition catalogs, but they both had a pretty broad appeal, so there weren't a lot of barriers to engagement between the, um, the audience and the content. Um, it seemed like a prime area to push, push these into new formats. And they also both had pretty easy opportunities to add new content beyond what's in the printed book. So yeah, um, the first one was Fashioning the Object, which was um, a book by the chair of our architecture and design department, Zoe Ryan. It was about the, con the confluence of art and fashion and design. Um, actually, this is a movie can see a little bit about how it, how it moves. Um, this was built with MagPlus, which is a platform most often used for magazines and annual reports and other things that feel more like periodicals. Um, it, the app is available on the Apple App Store. Um, it was really attractive to us because it's all based on InDesign templates. Um, it runs on InDesign plugin. Uh, it, it allows for really dynamic navigation and layered content and control over image placement and multimedia widgets and um, that was perfect, this exhibition included a lot of videos. Um, so this was a really great um, vessel for it. Video stills look really 
particularly horrible in print. Uh, but actual videos, when you're watching them, you don't necessarily think about that. Um, so this was perfect. Um, next up was Dawood Bay, Harlem, USA. This was built with, uh, well, first of all, the, the exhibition and the catalog is by the head of our photography department, Matt Wachowski. Um, and this was built with iBooks author, and it's available on the Apple iBooks store. Upon the initial release of iBooks author, it was really limiting software. And it, we started this project actually right after it was released. Um, just they had a set number of templates that weren't hugely flexible. Really, it's, it was designed to make textbooks. And if that's what you're doing, it was probably great, but that's not what we were doing. Um, it is a good platform for multimedia and web integration, but that w this didn't involve too much of that, so that wasn't necessarily a benefit. But this took us a really long time to complete, which ended up um, being sort of a boon because the latest re um, release of iBooks Author is way more flexible and has a lot more options. Um, we had to introduce a whole bunch of workarounds that um, we ended up not having to use with the latest, the latest software. Um, this one also has a little movie. So for this, we had the opportunity to work directly with the artist, both on the print and the digital book. Um, he's based in Chicago. He was kind of skeptical at first, but he came around. Um, and the head of our department, Sarah Guernsey, her husband, Richard Holland, um, founded the podcast Bad at Sports. I don't know if anybody's familiar. It's a great podcast. Um, but he did an, a, an episode where he interviewed Dawood Bay, and we repurposed the audio. So there, this book has two longer interviews with him, and then little um, snippets of him talking about various plates in the exhibition. Um, additionally, there was a show that he sort of curated. He selected objects from the collection, um, but that all was organized after the print book was done. And so with this, we were able to include some of that content and sort of get it published. Um, so next, I'm going to talk about digital scholarly catalogs, more frequently known as OSCE. Um, I'm guessing that a lot of people here know all of this, but I'll, for anybody who doesn't, in 2009, I think, is that right, 2009, uh, the Getty invited a handful of museums to take part in an experiment to try to build an online digital alternative to a traditional scholarly collection catalog, um, which are really big. They're expensive to produce. They're expensive to buy. They become outdated. They're not out re-editioned all that frequently. One of the first books I worked on when I came to the Art Institute of Chicago was um, Northern European and Spanish paintings before 1600 in the Art Institute of Chicago. And I think we printed maybe 1,000 or 1,100 of them, and the unit cost of each one was north of $250. It sold for maybe $80. And so, I mean, you know, like, obviously you don't make a book like that to make money, but it's still a pretty onerous thing. Um, so the aim here is just to reach, like, bring the reach of the web and the capabilities of interactive um, widgets to a scholarly audience without sacrificing that scholarly content and the integrity of information that would be expected from that audience. Um, and I think, you know, we've been pretty successful. This all started for us. We partnered with IMA Lab, um, and they, they built what came to be known as the OSCE Toolkit, which is based on Drupal. It's an open source platform. And based on the name, obviously, it's for scholarly, the scholarly community, as I said, curators and researchers, professors, that whole lot. Um, but it is free. Everything we've done with this platform is free, so it's available to anybody. Everybody's welcome. Um, at this point, we've released six volumes, four monographs on artists in our Impressionism collection, Monet, Renoir, Pizarro, and Kaibot. Um, and we've also released two exhibition catalogs. The first was James Enser, The Temptation of St. Anthony, which is the only example so far of a book that was a print, print project which we ported to OSCE. Um, with some expanded content. Um, and more recently, Whistler and Roussel, Linked Visions, which was just from this past summer. That was originally slated to be a print catalog. It lost um, funding. It was supposed to be grant funded, and something fell through. So we, we pushed it over to OSCE. Um, and it became a digital project relatively easily, but I'm going to come back to that. Um, and then in the next year or so, we have six more, seven more. And I'll just note one interest, like I've been talking all about these scholarly collection catalogs. 
we're about to use the platform for something pretty completely different. Um, we have a series of sh collection shows, one of which has already been mounted, but two more coming, called the, just the Modern Series, where um, they're untraditional, and we're going to use this platform for other purposes, but I won't get into it right now. Um, so the OSCE platform is pretty amazing. It's multi-platform. It looks good on an iPad, which you can see on the left there. It looks good on a that's a laptop screen. Um, it looks great on a 27-inch monitor. The layout scales responsively, um, so it keeps like a relatively good relationship between text and images. You can assign hierarchy to images for image importance. Um, you can see right here, there's a drawer at the bottom which you can pull up and see um, other notable images but that don't need to be in the text. Um, it has this humongous capability for specialized content delivery. Um, which has mostly, we've mostly used to foster a better communication or better collaboration between the conservation department and the curatorial department um, in our museum. All, all of the plates are like gigantically zoomable. Um, you have images with sliding layers that you can go back and forth between two states of an image like pre and post conservation or x-ray to regular light or anything. Uh, we're going to have 360 rotating views of 3D objects in uh, rapidly approaching catalog. There's the ability to include annotation layers to highlight elements of a painting that have been painted over. Um, we're working on an RTI viewer, which is reflectance transformation imaging, which is a hot topic in the conservation world. Um, and of course, there's, it supports basic multimedia, video, audio. Um, so it has uh, some quieter, but also very fundamental features. It's fully citable. It's additioned. Um, it's in library databases like WorldCat and whatnot. So it's really it's as legitimate as any giant print tome you've see you've seen. Um, but obviously, it's on the web. It's free, like I said. Um, that's all the good stuff. Uh, so I just want to say that this is actually the first PowerPoint presentation I've ever given. <laughs> And so I really wanted to include like really odd, like businessy clip art, and this is just <laughs> I just did it. This is what you get if you just search for challenges on Google Images. So like apparently to the web, challenges don't exist outside of business clip art. Um, so uh, the OSCE OSCE has a really pretty steep learning curve. Um, you got to know what you're doing. We have a full-time production coordinator working on these projects. Um, we have a full-time Drupal designer. Uh, we have a developer on staff, Tina, who is around. Um, she dedicates a ton of her time to the back end here. Uh, and just a, like a little anecdote, right now we have this little partnership with a design, like a senior design seminar at University of Illinois Chicago. And they're going to take one of our titles and port it to some new digital format, which is really cool. But we said, hey, you could try the OSCE toolkit. And this is a group of really digitally savvy 22-year-olds, and they don't know they don't know what to do. Um, I'm sure they could know what to do. It's just you need, like, you kind of need to be trained one on one. Um, the design is really elegant in its function, but it's pretty utilitarian. We've made minor customizations, mostly taking advantage of CSS uh, between the various volumes, but we've pretty much reached the limit of what we can do. Luckily, IMA Lab is um, working on new themes that'll kind of spice things up. That, which will be great for the, the modern series I was talking about that won't be quite as scholarly or traditional and doesn't need to be as much a direct analog of a book. Um, so challenges <coughs> part two. Uh, it wouldn't fit in one slide. Uh, discoverability has been sort of an issue. Like I was saying earlier about how exciting it was that the iStory is a real portal that people might be attracted to. Um, these just, they, they live on the Art Institute website, and they're not easy to just stumble across. Um, we've done a lot of work to see if they can, to get them into search results. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been pretty difficult to track success. We have Google Analytics, which Lauren has been deeply involved in. Um, we have data on how the citation tool is used, and user accounts and whatnot. Um, but even with all the data, we don't know what it means, because we've never done this before. We don't know if it's good or bad. Um, and, you know, finally, there's sustainability, which is, you can look at in a lot of different ways. You know, one really present concern is, like, a few years down the road, if our museum administration is no longer, <coughs> excuse me, I need a little water. 
if um if our leaders are no longer interested in supporting digital projects then and this languishes there's you know we got to figure out how to keep this content alive because it's really important scholarly research or you know in 15 20 years maybe drupal is no longer a, a, you know nobody's working on it anymore or in 50 years when the internet is only in our brains or refrigerators or um you know, this content is born digital. It doesn't exist in print. Um, Can I ask so, a question? Sure. The, the, the content is, is, the canonical content is in Drupal itself. It's not brought in to Drupal from an external source. It's a new issue text that's been compiled. Um, so you're asking if, it's, if it only exists in Drupal or if it's brought from somewhere else? Yeah. Um, it's brought from Word documents. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we've talked about how to make sure that this exists. Somebody suggested we print it out and give it, <laughs> give it to the Library of Congress. Um, so uh, we'll see. Um, you can't export it into a GitHub. Yeah, that's true. Straight from your platform. So if you were talking about the yeah. Earlier. Yeah, earlier. Um, yeah, Lauren is just pointing out that you can export from the ASCII toolkit into EPUB. Um, OK, yeah, I'm actually just about done. Um, and I will say it sounds like Eric and Greg from the Getty are working on some, some pretty cool solutions to some of these problems I'm talking about. So you should all come to Eric's talk tomorrow. Um, I'm just about done. What should a publisher do? This is a publisher having problems with technology. Um, that's <laughs> um, you got to roll with it. Like Steve Winwood said, um, I've talked about a bunch of challenges and pitfalls up here um, that are inherent to digital projects and digital projects alone, and also trying to take printed content and pushing it into a digital world. Um, but like, if I were up here talking about the challenges of print publishing, the talk would be twice as long, and that's been around forever. So like, <clears throat> I think it's smart not to get too concerned about the issues really specific to your platform, whatever platform you're trying to work on. Um, because those are always going to be around. Like, they're going to change. They're going to change all the time. But there are these sort of more evergreen problems, like budgets and deadlines and uncooperative authors and curators, um, you know, typos, arguments about style that are going to exist for a publisher no matter how, no matter how you're presenting it to your readers. So. I think it's important to just keep creating and keep problem solving, stay positive. That's the cliche I'm going to end on. <laughs> so there you go. There's my email if anybody. And before, thank you, Joseph. Um, before we take some questions, is James here? Is he out standing up? Is there anyone standing outside? It looks like our next speaker. Because <laughs> otherwise, you got half an hour to fill. Um, no one there? Is James Vitali in the room? No. Okay. Um, with that, then, why don't we uh, uh, open it up for questions? Uh, we are recording the session in audio. All the sessions at MCN are recorded. The audio is recorded. So I'm going to ask that you um, use the mics. We've got some wireless mics if you can pass them around to give a question. Okay? Let me. Lauren, can you? Hello. I'm wondering if you uh, have considered, um, or, or maybe you don't even have an app into which you could have your public, you know, your publications could be available through there. Yeah, I mean that's something we definitely talked about. We looked at this several years ago. We looked at uh, there was a MoMA app that served up a number of publications, but they're they seem like just PDFs. Like because we've been experimenting so much. Using these different platforms, I think it'd be pretty technically challenging to come up with one app that could contain them all. So, does that answer your question? Well, I was thinking um, of having your, your books as apps within a wrapper app. Right. So, so that the, 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 the print publication could be like an enhanced EPUB, but it would actually be an app. It would have much more interactability. Um, we have not thought about that really. 
just because I think it would be really challenging. Like, unless somebody was really supporting us and encouraging us to do something like that, I don't think we would go down that path. And why not? Um, because of the logistics. Because each, um, I mean, that's a good question. I, don't, I guess I don't have a good answer. I, I know inside why we wouldn't do it. All of our books are so different that you know, we chose the ones that we did port to a digital platform. We chose because they could be done. They could be, they could exist happily as a digital book. We do a lot of books that wouldn't really work on an iPad um, without really pretty drastically changing them. And just from a practical point of view, we don't have the resources to do that with every one of our books. I was just wondering how many videos you have included in your publications, and um, um, what, so tell me more about that kind of content, since obviously they wouldn't have been included in print. Yeah, so the Fashion and Oblique book, that has, I think, maybe five or six videos in it. Um, I should have pointed out that not all of them are actually embedded in the app. We have left, some of them are, but then some of them um, link you outside the pages to YouTube, which, which we did. Joseph, so are you all still working in iBooks and that Mac Plus program, or in the future are you planning on doing most things with one-house computers? Or um, the book is still all of our current, all of our current projects in the book in the digital realm are with Posse. Um, these were pretty much one-offs just to see what was possible. Um, we don't have, we don't have any plans to fully adopt one of the platforms. Like I, you know, I think if anything. One thing that can definitely be taken from my talk is that nothing, there's no one solution, you know, for an art book. Other questions? Yeah, do you want to pass, grab the mic? If you could find that solution to create such a book, as we said, with that one shot effort. Yeah, sure. If there was one turnkey solution that could do it all, that would be great. But do you mean would we do that? Yeah, I think we can. No, it's, it's the, the problem of finding the right technology to try it. Okay. Oh, if there is only yeah. one thing to achieve, or Thank is you. a matter of time or resources or all the things that problem is. So you're saying, are you asking what? That, uh, like we're not there yet. There's no, there's no holy grail. I mean, every one of our print books is different. So, you know, by, by extension, I think every digital project has to be different. Um, how responsive is the getting to your readers? Uh, how do you work with them, and who are the kinds of people that you find that they're also interested? Well, it's it's funny. The Posse was started as a Getty-funded initiative, but at this point, it's kind of out in the wild. Um, there's been, I mean, maybe you can talk about this. Uh, uh, yeah, so the Getty started the OSCE initiative. It was a grant-funded program. It was meant to be a sort of seed for future work, um, but it had a it had an end, basically. Yeah. It, had a sort of, uh, it ran its course, and we're, in fact, we're briefly doing, you know, we'll be releasing a final report on that um, in, the, in probably early next um, but now the idea is that the participants from the OSCE initiative have, I think almost all, I think all of them maybe, are continuing their work on their own in various different sorts of ways. So the Getty itself has, is no longer really actively involved in the program. Um, as a publication person at Getty, we are pursuing our own online catalog, but outside of that, we need to get that. that makes sense. Any other questions? I'll, we're almost to the break. Are you ready for 
download Vamp a little bit. Um, well, I actually had a, a, a question I wanted to ask about the um, Isoria yeah. platform. One of the things that you said about it was that what really you're doing is contributing content, and they're they're developing it. They're going to yeah. take care of a lot of that back end, and that kind of rang true to me or uh, sort of interesting departure point because I think as publishers. <coughs> We do that with print books in a way. We license our, our books out to for translation and that kind of thing mm -hmm. often. Um, but we don't, I don't think we've thought of that largely with other formats, like not just translation, but why shouldn't we be also sending our content out into the world yeah. on its own to let someone else make something of in a way, whether we have active control or not? I mean, is that something that you all have talked about in any way or? Not, like, not specifically. I mean, do you kind of mean in like a, Oh, it, whether it's a mashup or whether it's something like, um, you know, just like in the in I story case where you're where they're you're working more in, in tandem with them and you're going to get something, mm -hmm. or whether it's you know I was thinking of this in terms of James's um, upcoming talk on APIs, like an API for books where you could where that information is available in some more sort of more open way, more raw way. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I love that idea. Should we build that? Maybe we can do that next year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know what she would do. <laughs> okay. Can I get back to your desktop? Just close the window and then upload the desktop. Ah, there we go. There. Great, we're all set. Uh, save the file to the desktop somewhere. Uh, the other desktop. Okay. How do I move it to that desktop? I think it's um. Oh, there we go. There we go. Perfect. Oops. Almost. Okay. All right. Well, we're nearing close the close time. I will do my official introduction. Um. Our next speaker is James Vitale from LACMA, LA County Museum of Art in Los Angeles. Um, he's speaking today. On Great. Thanks so much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming out to this presentation today on APIs. I'm trying to keep this presentation at a pretty, pretty accessible level. I don't know the backgrounds of everybody in the audience, so hope that you'll find this interesting and informative, and we're going to dive right in. Thank you for your patience while we work through the technical glitch. So we're going to begin with a discussion of what are APIs. They are not just an Egyptian, ancient Egyptian bull deity. And um, we've got a little picture of our bull here for inspiration as we begin our, our talk. So many of you have probably heard this term in a number of different contexts thrown around. So let's first talk about what the words in APIs mean. And if there's any problems with hearing my voice, it's pretty loud. Just raise your hand and let me know. So application. First, um, I may not even use this. Can you hear me pretty well without the microphone? Can you actually use this as a short recording? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, great. So application, that talks about what we're doing. This is the kind of system or set of features and functionality with which we are interacting. And there can be any number of applications that we're dealing with, whether it's our, our dams, our CMS, our ticketing system, et cetera. Programming specifically deals with the rules, meaning the algorithms or heuristic methods that describe the how behind what we're doing. So there could be a number of different things that dictate the rules that we're going to use to achieve our desired outcome. So that's the programming part of our API. And most importantly is the interface. So this is going to be the specific mechanism that we provide to people in the outside world to interact with whatever application or applications are behind the scenes. So in your institution, you may have any number of applications that have valuable information in them 
that you want to provide a useful set of inter interfaces so that people either in the outside world or other departments within your institution can access the information within there. And so came the birth of this term APIs, which has been around in, for a long time and in a number of different ways. And you may find that APIs are made available to you by the software vendors that you license products from through open source places like Google, Yahoo, et cetera. And you may have even started to build your own APIs in-house. But today we're gonna learn a little bit more about this concept, why it's valuable and important, and how you may begin to leverage it within your own organizations. I actually have a term sheet up here. If I could have somebody kindly enough um, distribute that around. It has some useful acronyms that you'll hear referenced today. And I just wanted to be able to have that check the input terminal. Maybe we fell asleep. OK, we'll see if that comes back here. Oh, oh. There we go. OK, all right, thank you. Moving right along. So when we think about APIs, there are some common goals that we deal with in every one of these. APIs are providing us with a means to access information. So that's one of our first things that we do with them. There are some key questions raised when we talk about accessing information. The first is the question of authentication. This is all about who. So we want to know who is coming into the API. We want to be able to identify and be able to decide, should this person be able to access the API? And there's a number of different mechanisms through which that can be done. Once we've said yes or no, we then have the question of authorization. And this is about determining once we've allowed them into the interface, into the API, where they can begin asking questions to our information system, we have this question of authorization, which is what? What should they be allowed to access? What information, in what shape, in what form? And lastly, we have the question of encryption. This is protecting the information as we transmit it back to the requester. So these are just questions to have in mind that are relevant in today's world when we think about APIs. The next common goal is the actual exchanging of the information. So somebody on the outside world, or even somebody within your own institution, has made a request to this API. And we're gonna talk about specific examples later in this presentation, but right now we wanna just look at the concept at a high level and really appreciate and value what it is. So APIs are about giving access to information and then exchanging that information. There are many different formats that we can do this in. Some of these you may have already heard of, and this is why we also have the glossary sheet that I've handed out, just to give you at least the definition of the terms, what they, what they mean, and then you can go out certainly to Wikipedia and other sources for a longer history about them. Common formats that you'll hear when we deal with web-based APIs are XML, JSON, flat file formats, which are delimited. Many of you have dealt with comma-separated files, tab-separated files, et cetera. And there are many others, but these are a few that are very common when you're dealing with web-based APIs. Other considerations, depending upon your institution and the richness of the data that you're dealing with and the kinds of partners that you're dealing with, could be internationalization. You may have a diverse number of character sets that you're dealing with and Unicode characters, et cetera, and that data needs to be handled in a particular way if you're planning to exchange it with other folks all around the world and make sure that you don't get those characters in a garbled or messed up way. You want to preserve the integrity of your information. And we're in a very media-driven world. Um, last night at the Ignite discussion, we had a great talk about digital and what that, world, that word means for all of us. Digital translates into binary data. Sometimes we hear this term blobs or binary large objects, which are referenced in a lot of databases today. People often provide APIs that don't just transmit simple text, which is readable to us, and see your Unicode text, but often provide APIs that give access to binary information, digital downloads, and we need to take that into consideration too, depending upon what the needs are in your organization. Lastly, we have the goal, they should be easy to use. They should be able to be invoked in a pretty straightforward way, but then also provide flexibility and extensibility so that folks that are integrating with them can come up with creative and diverse ways of applying them within their own applications. So questions that come up in this context would be the richness of the interface. What can I do through your API? Does it let me search your information system? What kind of filtering of the data in your applications is possible? Can I do pagination? 
if that's appropriate, depending upon the kind of data that's there. And are there other advanced data retrieval options? I'll keep remembering to keep this awake. Sorry for that. We talk about the simplicity of the interface. It shouldn't be overly verbose to work with. I'm going to show you some examples of what APIs would look like in a browser-based context. And we can see how we can make them very, very simple, but then they may not necessarily be useful. Conversely, we can make them so complex that they're not very nimble. And then they almost become intrusive. And the level of interest for people to deal with them diminishes greatly. We also need to think about their impact on performance, stability, and just, quite honestly, the physical resources required to host them within the environments of our institutions. Some of our institutions host their own servers or host them on resources that are outside of our own physical, our own physical properties. And we have to be sensitive to what those computers, what those computing resources can actually do relative to the requirements of the API. And that goes back to the question of algorithms and heuristics. If we have to do a lot of number crunching, if we have to do a lot of heavy searching to produce the results of the particular API, it may not be conducive to what our goals are. So a brief history of APIs, just very quickly. Um, APIs have gone through several evolutions over the past several decades, very much paralleling the ever-changing shape of our global technology infrastructure. Um, back in the 60s through 80s, they went by a name called EDI, Electronic Data Interchange. Uh, folks who are familiar with that period of time may have heard this term when we think about the exchange of information within banking and finance, the automotive sector, manufacturing. This is back when folks were coding in COBOL and ALGOL and needed to interchange information between those systems. We didn't have the birth of the web back then, but we did have mechanisms for electronically transmitting information and having standardized interfaces for doing that were necessary. When we got into the 90s, several companies got together and came up with the idea of CORBA. This was a predecessor to what we look at as web services today. They introduced the concept of IDL, Interface Definition Language. Again, emphasizing that we want to be able to have a standard way of communicating with each other, abstracting the details of what kind of hardware or software is being used behind the scenes. And most readily, as we got into the 90s and through 2000s, and the world that we live in today, it's a world of a web services-driven model. And this is where we hear very ubiquitously terms like SOAP, which is, introduces other terms like WSDLs, XSDs, and XML. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about those. I'm just going to present them and mention them. And RESTful interfaces, which is a simple request response mechanism, which we're going to talk a little bit more today. So what are the common characteristics of an API? And here's where we're going to start understanding what these do, how they work, and be able to start designing them at a high level. But what's most important in the concept here is for everyone in this room, I don't expect you to be software developers or programmers, but you are the hearts and souls of your institutions. You understand the information needs, what the collaboration goals are with your colleagues and your peers, what those opportunities are, and to really be able to create meaningful APIs, we need to have useful requirements. It's up to all of us in this room to be able to express what is it we think folks on the outside want to be able to request out of the information pools at your museum, at your institution. Is it about membership data? Is there information about the conservation and archival efforts that are going on? Is there information in the collections database? Is there information about ticketing and sales? And when we think about that, that's going to be the language that you use to describe a request interface. So let's talk about these characteristics. First thing is that every API requires a protocol. That's the communication mechanism that's going to be used by the outside world to issue a request. So when we look at this global picture, somebody talking, making a request from Sao Paulo out in Brazil, out to Los Angeles, they need a protocol. The most common protocol that everyone in this room has interacted with is HTTP over the web. Hypertext transfer protocol. It's as simple as that. There are many other protocols, but that's the first step to having an API. 
So nine times out of 10, a web-based API is gonna be what folks interact with, HTTP. Now we talk about sending a request. This is all about how we ask for what we want. People on the outside, they're gonna integrate with your information system, usually want some kind of data out. What's the list of the most recent 100 objects added to your art collection? What were the most popular exhibitions in the last 10 years that folks attended at your institution? What do your ticket sales metrics look like? Any question that you can think of, there's really no, the only limit is your imagination, it's your own creativity. And there are other details here as far as simple and complex requests, asynchronous versus asynchronous. And then we have another, the, the third characteristic is there's a response. This is what we return back to the person requesting. How do we make that response meaningful? What information do we package into it? What are we gonna send back to the person in Sao Paulo? What happens if we can't respond? What if there's an error? What if, we haven't met, what if they haven't given us enough information in their question? Or they gave us the wrong criteria? So again, let's review. Common characteristics are the protocol. Essentially, that is the highway that you're riding on that connects the two places. The request, it's how somebody's going to send a question into your system. The response, it's how you're going to deliver a response. It's how you're delivering the information back. Think of it as the box from UPS or FedEx that arrives at your front door. And lastly, the data structure. It's what's inside that box that gets delivered to you. How are we going to shape the information about your sales data or your art objects or your digital media, et cetera? So crossing the boundaries, I'm just going to mention that the characteristics of APIs, they're language independent. When somebody's calling your API that's a web-based one, they don't know any of the details about what software or coding language it's been programmed in and it doesn't matter to them. Similarly, the person who's making the request be, could be coming from any kind of system and it doesn't matter to you, or at least a well-designed API, it shouldn't matter to you. The same is true of their platform and their hardware. APIs are meant to be agnostic to these things, and that's a really powerful quality of them. That's what allows us to cross boundaries of distance, hardware, and technology. We're building a generic interface over a common protocol, and it's a really great thing. So the next few slides we're gonna talk about, we're gonna go through a use case explora exploration and talk about each of these pieces at a very high level, but in a way that I hope will be accessible to all of you. And please feel free to raise your hand if any of these things um, don't come across in a clear way. It's important that we be able to talk about them. Part one is the protocol itself. So in illustration 5.1, I have shown here a simple URL, which is simply indicating that this is the server that's gonna host our hypothetical APIs. Should be pretty familiar to all of you. You've all gone to www.somethingoranother.com. In this case, we're using apis.museum.org. All that is, is the base point that we start from. It's just where we're hosting the APIs, nothing more. When we choose an appropriate protocol, we wanna think of these considerations up here. These are things that you can talk about further with your IT system administrator, with your IS department, and they can delve into them further. But they're part of what's gonna help you, guide you in deciding on whether a protocol like HTTP versus FTP versus something else is most appropriate. Now we're gonna look at the request. Again, the request is a key part of the interface in our API, that word interface, application programming interface. Typically support the ability to make a variety of requests. It would be unusual to have an API that just has one question you can ask. You could do that, but it would be a pretty limited API. This is the mechanism through which third parties are gonna query your system and ask it, please tell me this, please tell me that. And part of our role, and everyone in this room, if you ever were to write requirements or describe a request about building an API infrastructure at your institution, is to think about it in a flexible and sensible way. We want this request interface to be malleable. So, in the first illustration, I have shown you a simple, albeit pretty inflexible, request interface. 
there's some highlighting here that's marginally coming through. But the first word there, search object, you can think of that as the name of the request interface, search object. By first name, implicitly, is the criteria. But this one is really, really simple. We've just, I've literally called the entire thing search object by first name. And that's my API. Wow, well, it's pretty intuitive what it's going to do. It's going to search for an object by first name. That's all that it can do. It can't search by place made or location or title or anything else. So it has accomplished the goal of simplicity. And it is usable, but man, is it inflexible. And then it takes a value at the end. In this case, I've put Picasso. Well, it's a starting point. And that's where we're going to begin with anything. In the second example, we see how with some planning and good design, we can take the idea, the principle that we've expressed in the first one, and make it intuitive, but also much more flexible. So we're still preserving the idea of an object search, but now we're going to expose a parameter called filter by. So we want to name these things in ways that feel intuitive to us, using our English language. And you'll see in the first example, we've kept it very simple. And we say, we want to filter by title. So we're indicating what metadata or what field in our information system we want to filter by. And we're giving it the value blue boy. I want to think, I want to filter by things that have the words blue boy. OK, thank you. And then in the next example, we filter by the columns artist, placemate, and title. And we pass in corresponding values for those. So with a little bit of thought and effort, we're able to trim it down. And we're able to make it more flexible and more interesting. Things to think about in the response are consistency and reliability, speed and performance, usability, again, preserving data integrity, size, and format. What's more interesting to look at is the data itself. As we mentioned earlier, your responses can come in many different forms, XML, JSON, CSV. This is what would be downloaded back to the person, either in their web browser or in some other mechanism, a piece of software. Most importantly is the integration. So you've built one set of APIs, and there are many points of consumption. And this is really the key message here in terms of how you validate and warrant doing this in your organization. Well, why are we going to build these APIs? Uh, if you build it, will they come? It's that old field of dreams analogy. You want to give some thought to this. You can build a single set of APIs, and if you've given them good thought and good consideration, they can be used by mobile applications, your, int your intranet or website for analytics and reporting, enterprise applications, whether it's your CRM, your HR, finance, and academia and research. One common set of APIs, but used in many different settings. And that's a really, really powerful advantage and really drives home why we might give thoughtful consideration to using them in our organization. With just a couple slides to go, and then we'll go on to questions. So again, the benefits and values internally within your organization could be their use may improve operational efficiency. They can be used to automate routine processes, improve visibility and access to your institution's most valued data, and encourage support for routine data quality and cleansing. I think a lot of your organizations may find that the data is not as clean in certain places as you'd like it to be. Through APIs, the use and visibility of that data increases significantly. And then correspondingly, the desire to keep that data in good shape will also increase. Benefits and values. There can be a fairly low cost to implement APIs. There is a lot of great open source technologies out there. And I have another handout that will be given to you at the end of the session, which is a self-assessment questionnaire to help you get started with the brainstorming process and how you can evaluate what might be an opportunity on setting those up in your organization. They facilitate collaboration. They provide a public information resource. And they're an opportunity to express the interaction of art and technology by exploring digital, visual digital visualizations married to a data-driven API, which is something that can be really exciting for a lot of institutions if they give it some thought. So last slide, supporting your, institution go your institution's goals. I'm going to go ahead and ask folks to pass out that handout there if they would. Start out by identifying opportunities. And this is where the self-interview handout will assist you. 
collaborate with other departments, and brainstorm a list of goals and objectives. And as you take a look at this handout, which is also available for download on the MCN site, I, I hope you'll find it useful, and it's a great starting point. Thank you for attending, and um, questions are welcome and encouraged.